আমরা তো গরিব মানুষ আরে আমরা যে জায়গায় থাকি সে জায়গায় তুলো ঝড় বাবু বন্যে শুরু হলে তো আমাদের কষ্ট ঘরের ভিতরে জল ওঠে আর ধনীরা তো তা না ওরা ওগুলো দালানে থাকে উগার ঝরঝমন লাগে না ওরা খাওয়া দাওয়ারও সমস্যা নেই ওদের দালানের ভিতরে থাকে এসির ভিতরে থাকে ওনাদের তো কোনো হলো ধরে তো সহজ চাওয়া যায় না যে আমাদের জাগা দেন কি আমাদের বাড়ি বেঁধে দেন এ তো চাওয়া যায় না We have now crossed the threshold into human-induced climate change. We knew this for a very long time. They told us what was happening, but not all humans are equally responsible. Poor people emit, but they emit very, very little. They are not the ones who are causing the problem. Zarbar Naga is a leg. সে সময় তো হলো আমাদের দুর্যোগ আগে গেছে লাগে আমেরিকার নাম শুনেছি এই পর্যন্ত আমেরিকায় মানুষ যায় আসে প্লেনে যায় যাওয়া আসা করে ওই জায়গায় অত দূর তো লেভাবে নে তো about the right elevation for for this the right altitude good yeah we're, we're just below 2000 feet yeah this i think that this is like perfect louisiana is one of the united states's largest greenhouse gas emitting states Many people here are vulnerable to climate change. So in addition to being a place that's vulnerable to climate change, it's also an area that contributes to it. Until the 1990s, the United States was responsible for 40% of the pollution that was already in the atmosphere. And now China has overtaken the United States in total emissions, but per capita, Uh, we, we still are bigger polluters. There's a lot of open water, so yeah, if you look out over here, you're seeing a lot of open water, and a lot of this was solid land uh, 100 years ago. That's a lot of reasons. It's changes to the course of the Mississippi River, is climate change, and intense storms that, that have eroded the area. Yeah, and look, you can, can you dig, a, you can see those canals, you can see those long straight lines, those are canals that were cut in the marsh, those are, um, yeah, those are canals that have been cut in the marsh um, for, for 
oil and gas exploration. The state has lost over nearly 5,000 square kilometers worth of land over, over the last 100 years. Even under the more optimistic scenario that we'll lose well over 1,000 square kilometers worth of land over the next 50 years. So we're looking at a landscape that is going to remain risky and is going to probably become riskier as a place to live. I am from Plaquemines Parish, Louisiana. Been there all my life. It's a beautiful place to live, but it's a community that's struggling to hold on to its roots because of sea level rise caused by, you know, the climate change and different things. But mostly, we're going out to sea like the Titanic. It's really, down we going. Well, I'm, you're looking at the whole town. I am the town. There's only one person living there. That's me. Plaquemines Parish was the richest. I'll say it. They were the richest state in the, in the parish because of oil and gas. But look at the consequences we paid. Look at our environment. Look at all the dead oak trees and no river water. It's a battle because you're constantly fighting the storm surge from hurricanes. If it wouldn't be for that, I think everything would be good. I've been fighting hurricanes since uh, Hurricane Betsy. That was in 65. I was, then I had Hurricane Camille in 1969, Hurricane Juan in 85. Then I lost everything in one, one storm. It just amazed me how it covered houses, cars, cars moving down the street, just terrible. The water came up. It came all the way up to the window of the house. It looked like we were sitting in the middle of a river. Katrina totally changed the geographics of Plaquemines Parish forever, as far as people and just everything, a way of life. Keep your family members together. Make one single line and you, that can help us move you faster. Patients from nursing homes, from hospitals, waiting for planes to take them, well, they simply don't know where. I, I've never seen anything like this before. It's, it's uh, everyone's doing the best that they can. But thousands are still corralled here at the city's sports arena, the Superdome. Even countries like the United States where for example, when Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans in uh, the United States some years ago, not a single rich or middle-class white American lost their lives. We're dealing with one of the largest relief efforts in our nation's history, and the federal government's got an important role to play. Our first priority, of course, is to save lives. More than 1,200 poor black people living in the Ninth Ward of New Orleans lost their lives. In the richest country in the world, when they saw the hurricane coming, they did not rescue the poor people. bodies upstairs on the third floor. This morning I found one lady in a wheelchair dead in the ladies' bathroom and another lady laying on the floor by the ladies' bathroom dead. And then there's this guy right here that's dead that's been sitting out here for a while. People with more money always have more options when it comes to 
to everything climate related. And whether or not you can evacuate is an economic justice issue because you have to put gas in your tank to leave. You have to, you know, get a hotel room somewhere else. People with more money have more options to leave. When they give a mandatory evacuation, that's what it is. Take what you need and go because nobody wants to come save you. Do you have water? We need water. We need water. It was totally devastated by Katrina and uh, it was a ground zero. It was horrible. For 10 months, I walked every inch of that parish looking for coffins and tombs. I got a brand new airboat to drive to also do it. And then when you was in an airboat, it was total devastation because they had just debris everywhere. Try driving in that. That's when you know you're a good driver if you can get through that. After Katrina, this cemetery was a mess. They had tombs all over. You didn't know who was who. And I worked in here for months, trying to put people back into cement vault, you can see behind me, after the storm. When they come in, they pop. No mercy on nothing. Not even a cemetery. The devastation that that parish suffered for Katrina was monumental to its people and communities as far as just wiping out everything. Just picture that. Very quiet, no electricity, nothing, just total silence. We don't have a community anymore. The church used to be packed with all kinds of people. That's all caused from the environmental changes that have occurred. It caused people to move and they didn't want to come back and do it anymore. She'd so go to the church and, you know, I'm, I'm the only white woman in a church. That's crazy. Even if you look at rich countries, which are now being impacted by climate change, Almost invariably, the most vulnerable people who are suffering now are poor people. In the US, for example, it's one of the richest countries in the world, and yet 25% of the population live in substandard housing. But it's important to understand that, uh, that climate change is an issue that is shot through with inequality in multiple respects. Um, we see it in class terms, first and foremost, I guess most obviously. We know that it's the richest that are overwhelmingly responsible for, uh, for excess emissions. And so there is a very big disparity amongst who causes the problem and who suffers the consequences. Um, they feel abandoned, most of them. It's just not fair. Depression sets in, you, you need help. Some people need help. So we really have to have a very good plan. You know, once the state realized that our coastal land loss was really getting serious, it started possibly start rebuilding some of this areas that lost land. They came up with a master plan. One of the projects in the master plan is to rebuild the coast by partially diverting the flow of the Mississippi River. That would bring a lot of sediment into the landscape and it would bring a lot of fresh water into the landscape. Sediment is how you build land and fresh water carries nutrients. It can push salt water out to sea. If the plan is fully implemented, you're looking at several hundred 
square miles worth of land that, um, that would have otherwise been lost. And it will reduce flood risk over the life of the project by, every year by several billion dollars. We don't have a say-so in it. It's the state's master plan. But it, it's affecting the people of Plaquemines Parish. And some of them don't like it. Sediment is also can clog up the, the gills of oysters. Sediment can bury an oyster reef. My grandfather arrived here in 1904. He heard about the hardworking oyster life in Plaquemines Parish, Louisiana. They came from a very poor country, didn't have much money. In around 1920, he built him a camp where he got his first oyster lease. Back at the time, it was just a wild wilderness, basically. No levees to protect your homes from the river and stuff. But you didn't really need it back then because the land was a little higher. This diversion is, is a bad deal. They're gonna basically open the river up 25 miles north of here and just let the water uncontrollably flood into our prime, pristine estuary as bountiful seafood, oysters, shrimp, crabs, fish. We knew back then and we know it even more now, the devastating effects this is gonna have. Oysters can't move. So a healthy living oyster reef creates a healthy living coast. You kill off the oysters, you kill off the coast. We are the canary in the mine. This one massive, massive beast is going to flow tremendous amounts of water and it's gonna take millions of gallons of water to move ounces of sediment. And it's not gonna work. In the process, it's going to kill off all of our seafood industry. That's a good sign, great sign. Yep. yep. That's what we're looking for. That's our future right there, you know? Yep. We gotta keep the water right, everything's gotta stay right for that to thrive, but yeah. I'm gonna have to try one of these. No. Well, it's salty, but it's fresh. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it needs to be. My son is a fourth generation oyster farmer. They don't have a future here if this thing becomes comes to light. The family's been in this business for 120 years, approximately. It's, it's all we've ever done, and it's all I've ever wanted to do. I planned on doing this for the rest of my life, and now I don't know. It's easy to say, oh, I'll just go do something else, but there's not a lot of other opportunity here. Do you realize how many people are employed outside the coast, throughout the country, on some of the seafood that we produce here in the Barataria Basin that's going to be totally annihilated? We begged, please, let's come up with an alternate plan because this is going to destroy not only our livelihoods, but our way of life, our culture. Mother Nature always wins. So we always are at her mercy. And we just have to sit back, let it happen, and try again. There's no necessary contradiction between social objectives and ecological objectives. They can and must be accomplished at the same time. We, we have more than enough energy and resources to uh, ensure good lives for all several times over. I think the global system is broken. And therefore, a broken system does not solve itself. We're going to have to find new ways we do not need fossil fuels anymore. It's people knowing what to do, behaving 
consciously to do the right things that will help us solve this problem not by ignoring everybody else and looking after oneself. There is a false uh, expectation, particularly among rich people, that they can survive everything. Even rich people are going to be affected by the impacts of climate change, and they're going to have to deal with it. Selfish behavior is what got us into this problem, and selfish behavior will not get us out of this problem. It's hard um, because as a scientist, I study sea level rise and I work at a place that's vulnerable to sea level rise. And it's, it's hard. 4% to a dozen South Louisiana parishes lost to 4% of the population over the last two years. That means one in 25 people in several South Louisiana parishes moved out of the county. Schools are closing, and if you lose the, the you know, student age population, you're losing the next generation. People that are being born today are going to spend most, if not all, of their lives in a world that is warmer than the ones that their grandparents grew up in. And I think the question that's facing us is not if that will happen, but how many people will be impacted and how many people will suffer. I met a lot of people from New Orleans, and I used to have so many friends. I had so much fun cooking dinners, having people over. We were going duck hunting. I had plenty of ducks, you know. But through the years, all that started dwindling away. As we lost environment from storms, we don't have a place to gather anymore. The whole environment's totally different. You know, I consider myself poor, I do. Everybody thinks I'm rich, but I'm not. That's, the environment has, is, is to do with everybody's life. It's not just my life. It's everybody's life around the world. As the environment changes, your life changes. That's a true fact. Around the world, it seems natural disasters have become a frequent part of life. From floods to droughts and fires, it's now quite common to hear about extreme weather destroying infrastructure and, most importantly, people's lives. The United Nations says more natural disasters are coming due to climate change. So, is there a need to establish an international agency that specifically deals with such events? And would that help level the playing field when disasters strike in developing nations? We'll explore this with our guests in a moment. But first... Can we get out of the cycle of hurting the Earth? Man's the worst enemy. I'll say that. They're going to ruin it. Yeah. Sad. I'm fighting it out to the end. I'm going to be buried there, too, so. 